Hi everybody and welcome to Social Group. We're going to start off now with reading a story. Um, for the next few weeks I'm going to read a couple of chapters each time and the book that I've chosen is Star Girl by Jerry Spinelli and I have a special guest reader with me here today, my daughter Lily. Hi everybody. We're gonna um, be reading Porcupine Necktie. When I was a little when I was little, my Uncle P had a necktie with a porcupine painted on it. I thought that necktie was just about the neatest thing in the world. Uncle P would stand patiently before me while I ran my fingers over the silky surface, half expecting to be stuck by one of its quills. Once he left, he let me wear it. I kept looking for one of my own, but I could never find one. I was 12 when we moved from Pennsylvania to Arizona. When Uncle Pete came to say goodbye, he was wearing the tie. I thought he did so to give me one last look at it, and I was grateful, but then with a dramatic flourish, he whipped off the tie and draped it, around, draped it around my neck. It's yours, he said. Going away, present. I love that por that porcupine necktie so much that I decided to start a collection. Two years after we settled in Arizona, the number of ties in my collection was still one. Where do you find? A porcupine necktie in Micka, Arizona or anywhere else for that matter. On my 14th birthday, I read about myself in local newspaper, in the local newspaper. The family selection section. section ran a regular feature about kids on their birthdays. And my mother had called in some info. At least the, the, last. the last sentence read as a hobby, Leo Borlock collects porcupine neck. Several days later, coming home from school, I found a plastic bag on our front step. In the gift, inside was a gift wrapped bag, age tied, back package, age tied, no, package tied, package tied. Oh yeah. Package tied with yellow ribbon. The tag said, Happy Birthday. I opened the package. It was a porcupine necktie. Two porcupines were tossing darts with their quills while a third was picking its teeth. I inspected the box and tagged the paper. Nowhere could I find the giver's name. I asked my parents. I asked my friends. I called my Uncle Pete. Everyone denied knowing anything about it. At the time, I simply concerned, considered. considered the episode a mystery. It did not sword okay. occur me that it was being, I was being watched. We were all being watched. Sorry about that. Chapter one. Did you see her? That was the first thing Kevin said to me on the first day of school, 11th grade. We were waiting for the bell to ring. See who, I said. Ha, he craned his neck, scanning the mob. He had witnessed something remarkable. It showed in his face. He grinned, still scanning. You'll know. There were hundreds of us milling about, calling names, pointing to summer tan faces we hadn't seen since June. Our interests in each other were never keener than during the 
the 15 minutes before the first bell of the first day. He punched, I punched his arm. Who? The bell rang. We poured inside. I heard it again in homeroom, a whispered voice behind me as we said the Pledge of Allegiance. You see her? I heard it in the hallways. I heard it in English and geometry. Did you see her? Who could it be? A new student? A spectacular blonde from California or from back east where many of us came from? Or one of those summer makeovers, someone who leaves in June looking like a little girl and returns in September as a full-bodied woman. A 10-week miracle? And then in Earth Science, I heard a name. Star Girl. I turned to the senior slouching behind me. Star Girl? I said. What kind of name is that? That's it. Star Girl Caraway. She said it in homeroom. Star Girl? Yeah. And then I saw her at lunch. She wore an off-white dress so long it covered her shoes. It had ruffles around the neck and cuffs and looked like it could have been her great-grandmother's wedding gown. Her hair was the color of sand. It fell to her shoulders. Something was strapped across her back, but it wasn't a book bag. At first, I thought it was a miniature guitar. I found out later it was a ukulele. She did not carry a lunch tray. She did not carry. She did carry a large canvas bag with a life-size sunflower painted on it. The lunchroom was dead silent as she walked by. She stopped at an empty table, laid down her bag, slung the instrument strap over her chair, and sat down. She pulled the sandwich from the bag and started to eat. Half the lunchroom kept staring, half started buzzing. Kevin was grinning. What'd I tell you? I nodded. She's in 10th grade, he said. I hear she's been homeschooled till now. Maybe that explains it, I said. Her back was to us, so I couldn't see her face. No one sat with her, but at the tables next to her, hers, kids were cramming two in a seat. She didn't seem to notice. She seemed marooned in a sea of strange buzzing faces. Kevin was grinning again. You thinking what I'm thinking, he said. I grinned back. I nodded. Hot seat. Hot Seat was our in-school TV show. We had started it the year before. I was producer-director. Kevin was on-camera host. Each month, he interviewed a student. So far, most of them had been honored student types, athletes, model citizens. Noteworthy in the usual ways, but not, any, but not especially interesting. Suddenly, Kevin's eyes boggled. The girl was picking up her ukulele, and now she was strumming it. And now she was singing. Strumming away, bobbing her head, shoulders singing, I'm looking over four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. Stone silence all around. Then came the, the sound of a single person clapping. I looked. It was a lunch line cashier. And now the girl was standing, slinging her bag over one shoulder and marching along among the tables, strumming and singing and strutting and twirling. Head swung. Eyes followed her. Mouths hung open. Disbelief. When she came by our table, I got my first good look at her face. She wasn't gorgeous, wasn't ugly, a sprinkle of freckles across the bridge of her nose. Mostly, she looked like a hundred other girls in school, except for two things. She wore no makeup, and her eyes were the biggest I had ever seen, like deer's eyes caught in headlights. She twirled as she went past, her flaring skirt brushing my pant leg, and then she marched out of the lunchroom. From among the tables came three slow claps. Someone whistled, someone yelped. Kevin and I gawked at each other. Kevin held up his hands and framed a marquee in the air. Hot seat, coming attraction, star girl. I slapped the table. Yes, we slammed hands. When, Chapter two. When we got to school the next day, Hillary Kimball. Hillary Kimball was holding court at the door. She's not real, Hillary said. She was sneering. She and... She's an actress. She's an actress. It's... It's a scam. It's a scam. Someone called the... Who's scamming us? The administration. Administration. Administration, the principal. Who else? Carries. Who cares? Who cares? Hillary wagged her head and the, at the observatory. Absurdity. 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 Absurdity of the question. A hand flashed in the air. Why? School spirit, she spat back. 
They think this place was too dead last year. They think if they plant some nutcase in with the students, like they plant narcs in school, someone else shouted. Hillary glared at the speaker, then continued. Some nutcase who stirs things up that maybe all the little students will go to a game once in a while or join a club instead of making out in the library, chimed another voice. And everybody laughed and the bell rang. We went in. Hillary Kimball... Kimball's theory spread throughout the school and was widely accepted. You think Hillary's right, Kevin said? Stargirl's a plant? I snickered. Listen to yourself. He spread his arms. What? This is Micah Area High School, I reminded him. It's not a CIA operation. Maybe not, he said, but I hope Hillary's right. Why would you hope that? If she's not a real student, we can't have her on the hot seat. Kevin wagged his head and grinned. As usual, Mr. Director, you fail to see the whole picture. We could use the show to expose her. Can't you see it? He did the marquee thing with his hands. Hot seat uncovers faculty hoax. He st I stared at him. You want her to be a fake, don't you? He grinned ear to ear. Absolutely. Our ratings will go sky high. I had to admit, the more I saw of her, the easier it was to believe she was a plant, a joke, anything but real. On that second day, she wore a bright red baggy she wore bright red baggy shorts with a bib and shoulder straps overall shorts. Her sandy hair was pulled back into twin ple plated pigtails, each tied with bright red ribbon. A rogue a rouge smudge applied appled each cheek, and she had even dabbed some oversized freckles on her face. She looked like Heidi or Bo Peep. At lunch, she was alone again at, at her table. As before, when she finished eating, she took up her ukulele, but this time she didn't play. She got up and started walking among the tables. She stared at us. She stared at one face and then another and another. The kind of bold, I'm looking at you stare you almost never get from people, especially strangers. She appeared to be looking for someone, and the whole lunchroom had become very uncomfortable. As she approached our table, I thought, what if she's looking for me? The thought terrified me. So I turned from her. I looked at Kevin. I watched him grin goofily up at her. He wiggled his fingers at her and whispered, Hi, star girl. I didn't hear an answer. I was intensely aware of her passing behind my chair. She stopped two tables away. She was smiling at a pudding-bodied senior named Alan Furco. The, the lunchroom was dead silent. She started strumming the, the uke and singing. It was happy birthday. When she came to his name, she didn't sing just his first name, but his full name. Happy birthday, dear dear Alan Fru Furco. Alan Furco's face turned red as Bo Peep's pigtail ribbons. There was a flurry of whistles and hoots more for Alan Furco's sake, I think, than hers. As Stargirl marched out, I could see Hillary Kimmel across the lunchroom raising, rising from her seat, pointing, saying something I could not hear. I'll tell you one thing, Kevin said as we joined the mob in the hallways. She better be fake. I asked him what he meant. I mean, if she's real, she's in big trouble. How long do you think someone who's really like that is going to last around here? Good question. Micah Area High School, MAHS, are not was not exactly a hotbed of conformity of nonconformity. There were individual variants here and there, of course, but within pretty narrow limits. We all wore the same clothes, talked the same way, ate the same food, listened to the same music. Even our dorks and nerds had an M A H S stamp on them. If you happen to somehow distinguish ourselves if we happen to somehow distinguish ourselves, we quickly snap back into place like rubber bands. Kevin was right. It was unthinkable that Stargirl could survive or it least survive unchanged among us. But it was also clear that Hillary Kimball was at least half right. This person calling herself Stargirl may or may not have been a faculty plant for school spirit, but whatever she was, she was not real. She couldn't be. Several times in those early weeks of September, she showed up in something outrageous, a 1920s flapper dress, an Indian buckskin, a kimono. One day she wore a denim miniskirt with green stockings, and crawling up one leg was a parade of enamel ladybugs and butterfly pins. Normal for her were long floor, floor brushing pioneer dresses and skirts. Every few days in the lunchroom, she serenaded someone new with happy birthday. I was glad my birthday was in the summer. 
In the hallways, she said hello to perfect strangers. The seniors couldn't believe it. They had never seen a 10th grader so bold. In class, she was always flapping her hand in the air, asking questions throughout, though the questions often had nothing to do with the subject. One day, she asked a question about trolls in U.S. history class. She made up a song about isosceles triangles. She sang it to her plain geometry class. It was called Three Sides Have I, But Only Two Are Equal. She joined the cross-country team. Our home meets were held on the Micah Con Country Golf Course. Country Club Golf Course. Red flags showed the runners the way to go. In her first meet, out in the middle of the course, she turned left when everyone else turned right. They waited for her at the finish line. She never showed up. She was dismissed from the team. One day, a girl screamed in the hallway. She had seen a tiny brown face pop up from Star Girl's sunflower canvas bag. It was her pet rat. It rode to school in the bag every day. One morning, we had a rare rainfall. It came during her gym class. The teacher told everyone to come in. On the way to the next class, they looked out the windows. Star Girl was still outside, in the rain, dancing. We wanted to define her, to wrap her up as we did each other, but we could not seem to get past we could not seem to get past weird and strange and goofy. Her ways knocked us off balance. A single word seemed to hover in the cloudless sky over the school. Huh? Everything she did seemed to echo Hillary Kimball. She's not real. She's not real. And each night in bed, I thought of her as the moon came through my window. I could have lowered my shade to make it darker and easier to sleep, but it never. But I never did. In that moonlit hour, I acquired a sense of the otherness of things. I liked the feeling of the moon the moonlight gave me, as it wasn't the opposite of day, but its underside, its private side. When the fabulous purred on my snow white sheet, like some dark cat come in, come in from the desert. It was during one of these night moon times that it came to me that Hillary Kimmel was wrong. Star Girl was real. All right, guys, that concludes our story for, for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time we'll pick up with chapter three. Have a great day. Enjoy. Bye.